Hello, and welcome back, everyone, to the MSU WMA podcast. As usual, I'm your host, Costa G, and I've got a very special episode for you this time around. My guest today is downtown Josh Brown. Josh was recently the keynote speaker for our Student Success Summit, where we partnered with FPA of Michigan to provide a day full of speakers and employment opportunities to students. Josh is also a personal hero of mine, so it was an awesome experience to host the keynote and now share it with you all. Stay tuned, because we've got a great episode. All right. So I just want to welcome you, Josh. Um, like Stephanie said, we're so thankful that you took time out of your really busy day to come and speak with us. So Josh, uh, I guess to start off, can you take us a little bit through your background? Most of our attendees are um, college undergrads. So maybe if you could go from there and, and get to right to where you are now. Yeah. And thanks so much for having me. And uh, Michigan, what's popping? Love seeing <laughs> uh, kids interested in financial planning as a profession. We are the best, the best and most well-functioning part of uh, the financial services space. Let me just start with that. Hands down, we are the segment of financial services that did best through the financial crisis. Um, I know a lot of you are too young to really remember what that was like. But if you look, trading, blow up. Investment banking, blow up. Like every single segment of Wall Street was an outright debacle requiring massive bailouts from the government. Financial planners were the people who saved America during that time because financial planners kept their clients invested through some of the worst volatility this country has ever seen. And on the way out of that crisis, uh, 401k balances ballooned, right? Household net worth exploded. So that is all thanks to the work of financial advisors all over the country. So as a result, our side of this industry has been greatly rewarded. We are still the fastest growing segment of financial services. And in fact, anytime you read an earnings report from Bank of America or Morgan Stanley or JP Morgan or Wells Fargo, every time uh, the bright spot is wealth management, every time. Right. That's where all the growth is. And there's a good reason for that. It's not because I'm so handsome. <laughs> the reason is that the work financial planners and financial advisors do, it's not optional. It's the most necessary thing on earth. People work their whole lives to save money, save these 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 nest eggs. Nothing is more important then the way that gets cared for and managed and, and the way things are planned out. Cause we're not talking about um, basis points. We're not talking about spreadsheets. This is people's lives, their whole life. So I get very emotional when I talk about my industry and I think we deliver something that's bigger than launching IPOs or, or mergers and acquisitions, not to put that stuff down, I just don't think that touches as many people's lives as what we're doing, right? So if you become a financial advisor or a financial planner, you will be able to spend the rest of your life walking with your head held high, knowing that regardless of how much money you make, regardless of how big of a practice you build, you are literally the light in, 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 people's, in people's lives, right? The people that become your clients, you touch their lives personally. You're not executing banking transactions. You're not trading stocks for them. That's not what this is. This is about helping people see the light at the end of the tunnel after 20, 30, 40 years of working and saving. Um, and so, so that's the first thing I wanted to start with. What was your question? I feel like it was good. And <laughs> no, I just no. was like, yeah, whatever, no. I'm going to do my thing. Yeah, no problem. I think all, all, right. all, the, all that stuff you just said is absolutely true. And, and oh, wait, 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 my background. So real quick, yeah, I was a retail... Yeah. I was a retail stockbroker when I started in this business. Um, I didn't take high school very seriously. I, I didn't take college very seriously. I grew up in the 1990s on Long Island. And if you were a young man on Long Island in 1998, the only thing that you wanted to do was be a stockbroker um, so, or play for the Islanders. So <laughs> I uh, ended up cold calling um, at some like bucket shop, boiler room type places and 
then I kind of found like a good firm to be a stockbroker at. But it wasn't until 08 and the crisis that I looked back on all the stuff I had been doing and realized this is not helping anybody. Like I'm calling people up, I'm pitching them stocks. We're trading. Sometimes we win, sometimes we lose. Nobody really needs this. And that's when I got very serious about my career. And uh, I kind of had nothing to lose. So I left the retail brokerage side and I went over to the investment advisory side. I dropped my Series 7. I got my Series 65. And right around then, I started my blog, which is thereformbroker.com. And it built an audience like almost overnight. I was very lucky because if it had taken longer, I probably would have given up on it. Um, but that's, that's my, my origin story from, from when I was about your age uh, to, uh, to where I've gotten today so far. And I am far from done. There's a lot of work still to do to, to get to where I want to be. Yeah, absolutely. So at this point, we're just going to open it up for questions. So like I said, just go ahead and hit the raise hand if you have a question for Josh. Um, otherwise, I've got a list, but I don't want to use my list. I'd rather have somebody ask a question. Okay, so we've got Samuel. Hello, Sam. Hello, can you hear me okay? Yeah, we can. Can you go ahead and introduce yourself, say what school you're from, and then fire away? Um, my name is Sam. I'm also working on like um, starting my own practice in like investment advising. Uh, so I'm working on getting a Series 65. Uh, my question for you is, how hard was it for you to like start your own like wealth management um, or portfolio management business as far as like doing a Series 65 after you took the examination and everything? Well, so f for me, I, I didn't start that way. I started off as, as a broker working with a Series 7, and I never started my own firm. I always worked at other people's brokerage firms, and they were not good firms, and we were not doing high-quality work. But and, and at the time, I was very unhappy with the state of my career, and I was becoming more and more aware each year that I was not in a position to succeed. However, looking back, I've learned to appreciate that period of time I went through because I learned everything not to do, right? I learned by examples that you don't want to follow. And so I still make mistakes every day, um, like everyone else, but I don't make the same mistakes. And I saw some of the most catastrophic trading, investing, just horrendous decision-making, biases, um, cognitive dissonance. I saw like everything not to do very, very much like up close and personal. And so I, I now look back and say that was a blessing, but it took me to answer your question more directly. Uh, and hopefully you guys are, are smarter than I was. It took me a good 10, 11 years to break away from that. And it, again, it wasn't really until I was like 31, 32 that I knew what I wanted to do when I, when I grew up. So I'm 43 now, just for context. So almost half of my career up until this point was spent in the wrong position. That's not necessary. And I don't, I don't recommend anybody try to do this the way I did this. Um, however, there was a, a, a blessing to that. We didn't launch our own firm, my partner Barry and I, uh, we didn't launch our own firm until September of 2013. So I got licensed in like 98 so that should give you a sense of like how long I spent learning the business before having the audacity to be like, I can do this myself and own my own firm. Thank you. Okay. I think Riley was next. Okay. Can you guys hear me? Okay. Yes, we can. Yes. Sweet. So I'm Riley. I'm from uh, Grand Valley. Uh, I was wondering what kind of resources did you use to prepare yourself to open up your own firm and really, um, trust that you could take care of people's investments and their, their, their life savings. So one of the most important things that I've learned in this industry is to work with people and, and have people you can rely on. So there are a lot of people that start their own firm by themselves and they succeed. I don't think I'm that type of person. I think I really needed to be surrounded by other people so that we can share the, the workload and really mm -hmm. build something that could scale and be a, a, a meaningful business. So my partner, Barry, um, who is now 59 years old, 
Um, so I guess he was in his early fifties when we started uh, working together, but you know, I really felt like he's got, you know, more, more experience in the industry. He's got more contacts. Uh, people know who he is. He had written a best-selling um, book about the financial crisis in 2009. And I think his name and his reputation on Wall Street opened some doors for us that I might not have been able to have seen opened just to me personally. So having right. a partner was really, really important. I could not have done this on my own. I also had two younger partners who are to this day uh, still running the business with us. Um, and they are Michael Batnick, who you guys might know from his blog, The Irrelevant Investor, and his podcast, Animal Spirits. By the way, Michael's co-host on Animal Spirits is Ben Carlson, who's uh, Grand Rapids, Michigan. Um, so, so Michael is director of research. And then my partner, Chris, who, um, who had worked at Wells Fargo and then came to us because he was fans of our blog. Uh, and he was just like, I want to work with you guys. And we're like, all right, cool. <laughs> uh, and it really wasn't that much more elaborate uh, than that. But the four of us launched the firm. And it was important that we had all four of us because of the different things that each of us wanted to focus on. So Michael focusing on the portfolios and the asset management and building out all of the investment side of what we do for clients. Chris was a certified financial planner, had been through the Vision 2020 training program at Wells Fargo and really understood practice management at a very deep elemental level. What does it mean to set client expectations, how many proactive contacts per during the course of the year? When are the planning meetings? How often should you or should you not talk about portfolio? What software user interface works best so that clients can log in and see information, but only see the right information? Chris understood all that stuff and I didn't. So it was really finding people that you can trust and work with and build something together that was the most important resource to answer, to answer your question. I don't, I don't think I could have gotten nearly as far as I have if I had launched my own firm and then tried to bootstrap it to the point where I was hiring a person and then hiring another person. I really needed to be working with like the super friends and all of us having our strengths and having our weaknesses and relying on each other. That was very, very key and still is to this day. Gotcha. Thank you. Hey, Josh, we also know um, Batnick from What Are Your Thoughts, right? Oh, yeah. Michael's, uh, <laughs> Michael's an original. The fans, the fans love Mike because Mike doesn't sugarcoat anything. He tells you, exa he tells you exactly what he thinks. And when he, when he thinks he has no valid opinion, he'll just say, I don't know. And, <laughs> you know, that's really rare. Most people on, on Wall Street have an answer for everything. So yeah. most people don't say, I don't know. Absolutely. All right, let's go to Jake next. Jake. Hi, uh, Jake Caronimo, uh, the Wealth Management Association here at Michigan State. Uh, good to have you in here, Josh. Um, my question is, what is the most fulfilling aspect of financial advising? And why do you think it's such a growing industry? Well, so here's the math. You have about 69 million or 70 million baby boomers um, still alive and kicking. And let's hope they, they continue to uh, live a long and, and prosperous retirement uh, period, you know, because they look, these are people that spent their entire lives working and saving, and they did a really good job in some cases, and in some cases, not such a great job. Um, but the, 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 the baby boomer retiree generation is still very large, and they're living longer than any previous generation ever did. And they're living a retirement that's longer than any previous generation ever did. So if you go back a couple of generations, retirement was death. It was literally, you work till you're 65, probably for the same company, right? You show up every day, nine to five, work 40 hours a week. You work at the plant, whatever it is. They give you a gold watch. You retired for two years, you have a heart attack, you're dead. <laughs> no, I'm, not, I'm not exaggerating. That's like literally what it was. So retirement is a very recent phenomenon and investing for our own retirement is even more recent. This is really only the last 40 years. Prior to that, it was pensions. 
You didn't have to worry about what was in your portfolio. You had a fixed benefit coming to you uh, every two weeks, like a paycheck. And you didn't have that long to go that you were getting that. Everything's changed in a good way, maybe. So if you make it to 65 years old now, um, you have a one in four shot of making it to 95 or 93. Think about that. You might have 30 years in retirement. What are the implications of that? Well, a lot of demand for stocks. <laughs> people, people are like, well, why, why is the market at 21 times earnings? Well, maybe because 200 million people need to rely on stocks for the next three decades. You think that might have something to do with it? It used to be way easier. You would subtract your age from the number 100, and that would be your stock to bond ratio or bond to stock ratio. So if you were 70, you said, all right, I'll be 30% stocks, 70% bonds. That's when bonds paid five, six, 7%. Not happening. Bonds are 1%. If I tell you what they are, uh, factoring in inflation, <laughs> it's effectively zero. You might even be losing money in fixed income, right? High grade fixed income. 10 year treasury, 1.2%. Okay. If I tell you inflation is 2% and that inflation statistics are actually a lie, it's more like 3%. Do the math. How much money are you losing on a million dollars in bonds? Okay. The most rewarding part of what we do as financial advisors is help regular people understand the trade offs and that are necessary, the amount of risk they have to take necessary risk, the difference between volatility and risk. These are not the same thing, right? This is what we do for a living. And it's not as simple as telling somebody something once. You guys know what it's like dealing with your parents. You often have to tell them the same thing every week, right? Mom, I love you. I told you, don't call me Friday nights. You know where I'd be. Come on. <laughs> right? So, uh, but this is, the, this is the job. This is what we do. Now, that's for the boomer generation. For the Xers, I think I'm, a, I'm either a young Xer or an old, old millennial. I don't know. I go back and forth on that. I was born in 77. For people my age that are now in their peak earnings years, people in their late 30s through their 40s, this is when people are earning the most money they will in their career. But... They also have the same, the highest expenses at the same time. My daughter's uh, 15. It's hard to believe, but in three years, we're sending her to college. Crazy. Um, so like th this is the time that people are saving, are, are earning the most, but also have the highest expenses. Financial advisors play a very important role uh, for that generation because th it's all about trade-offs. How many vacations can we take? The kids are only going to be young once. We want to do these things now, but what's like overkill? How much is too much? Because we also want to be able to help them with their tuition or we want to be able to help them with their first apartment, like whatever it is. So like these are the types of conversations we're having with people in their 30s and 40s and 50s. Um, and then for the, the younger generation, people closer to your age, I would argue asset Asset allocation and good spending habits are more important than traditional financial planning. And wealth management is not really a topic for people in their 20s. There's no wealth yet. It's just too soon. They haven't accumulated enough assets. And quite frankly, they shouldn't be worried about hoarding assets as much as they should be worried about investing in their own career. So there's a conference they want to go to because they might meet some people to network. That'll be good for their, like, they should do that. That's as valuable or more than another $500 in an S&P fund at, at 24, right? So just, so just thinking about that cohort and, and just saying to people, yeah, you should spend money on that. Should I go back to school? Yeah. Here's what the math looks like, postgraduate education. Like this is, this is a better investment right now for you than uh, GameStop. Trust me, <laughs> right? So I think financial advisors 
have a role to play for for every generation right now. It's just a different conversation, but it's very rewarding to me to set people on the right path and give them the math that backs those comments I've just made, right? I'm not walking you guys through the numbers, but if you were clients, that's what I would be doing. All right, awesome. Let's go to Jake Myers next, please. Hello, thank you, Josh, for uh, everything you've shared so far. Um, I have a quick question. Uh, reflecting on your experience, what is the biggest piece of advice you'd give the students preparing themselves to uh, enter the financial advising profession? I think read books about um, behavioral investing, behavioral psychology, uh, and, and really understand people. So I spoke to a young lady uh, two weeks ago. She's a certified financial planner. And she's looking to take her career to the next level. She's been like working at a registered investment advisory firm for five years. And she's got like 25 clients who are like mainly, she's their main point of contact and she loves working on their financial plans. And she was saying to me, Josh, you know, I sometimes get questions from them about like the markets or like about investment stuff and sharp ratios and all this stuff. And I, I can answer them, but I feel inadequate. So I'm thinking about getting my CFA to become a chartered financial analyst. And I said to her, I forget her name. We'll call her Mabel. I, I says to Mabel, I says, I understand that you think attaining the CFA would make you more confident in those investment conversations, but why don't you focus on instead of, inst instead of, trying to sound like you're a hedge fund manager, why don't you focus more on the human side of what you're doing? Because in the end, that's what the clients truly value the most. They don't expect you, their financial planner, to talk like um, Bill Ackman or, or David Einhorn. Like that's not their expectation. They understand that that's not what you are. So I'm not saying don't get the CFA, but what if instead you concentrated on turning those 25 clients into referral, referring clients and took your practice to 50 clients? And what if instead you, you spent your time reading more about um, humanity as opposed to markets? Because really what we do is a very human endeavor. And I'm going to tell you guys something that should make you all very hopeful, which is that anything that can be automated – in our economy in the next 20 or 30 years will be automated. I know there was this big push like 10, 10 years ago, five years ago, learn to code, learn to code. The computers are going to do all the coding. That's, that's backwards. That's backwards. The careers that are going to have value are the careers that emotionally solve problems for people. The careers where you can make someone feel something, in our case, security and confidence about the future, right? In the case of uh, other people, artists, poets, screenwriters, um, podcasters, right? YouTube influencers. It, you can mock those people. Oh, they're not as smart as people who can code. No, but if you can build an audience and you can touch a lot of people, you will have value regardless of automation. Last time I checked, Nobody's reading a book written by a computer. Nobody's listening to a podcast that's, you know, AI, right? People want to be touched by people, like emotionally, spiritually, uh, relationships. So those are the professions that have the most value in the autonomous future. And one of the things that we say in, in, about our business and in our industry, standardize the process, personalize the advice. We have 1,500 households as wealth management clients all over the country, We're managing $1.8 billion. We have standardized much of what we do day to day so that software is running it, right? On uh, trading operations, moving money, account opening, onboarding, all of that stuff, there's a lot of software involved. And that's the part that should be automated and will become more automated as time goes on, right? 
But then the relationship part is the part you can't automate. That's the personal, right? So standardize the process, personalize the advice. If you do that, you will build a very large scaled practice um, where clients are happy and you are capable of running it and managing it uh, in a way that there aren't mistakes and problems and issues every day. So that's what we strive for as a firm. And that's the way that I would be thinking about preparing yourself um, for, for the future. Understand people and focus on how you can build relationships, personal relationships. That's going to be the key. Awesome. Great question, Jake. Uh, let's go to Valerie Chan next. Hi, I'm Valerie, and I'm a freshman in Western Michigan University. So um, my question is, what are the strengths that would help me in this job as a financial planner? And also building on the last, the last question by the last person, um, are there any book recommendations you have for the behavioral psychology? Okay. So wait, what was the first? I, I remember the second question. I already forgot the first one. Yeah, I think she was just expanding on um, what the last question was. So I guess maybe specific rec recommendations you have or strategies that you've, you've used to kind of deal with people. Am I getting that okay. right? Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Valerie. So I, I'll give you the two books that changed my life. The first one is called Simple Wealth, Inevitable Wealth. And this is the first one. It doesn't look like this anymore. This copy is, uh, I don't know, 10, 11 years old. Um, Nick Murray does not sell it on Amazon. You have to buy it from nickmurray.com. I came across this book in 2009 or 2010, and it absolutely changed my life. It is the story that you will become very well-versed in. It is the story of why it's so important to have equity stock market investing investments be at the forefront of everyone's portfolio. It explains the difference between risk and volatility, which I alluded to earlier, by which I mean the way that you guys are being taught finance, mathematically it's correct, but it's basically that bonds are safer, stocks are riskier. But in fact, the truth is the exact opposite. Bonds are risky, stocks are safe, because over every meaningful period of time, 10 years, 15, 20, 30, 50 years, stocks are going to do better than bonds. The same is not true for every one year period of time. So the question is, when do you want your risk? Do you want it now in your 20s and 30s? Do you want your volatility now when you can replace money in the market and you can live through it because you have a long time or do you want it later when you haven't invested enough and you haven't taken enough risk and you don't have enough money to live on in retirement and we talked about the potential for living a 30-year retirement right so when do you want your risk the real risk is running out of money that's the real risk it's not seeing a drawdown in your portfolio it's not risk especially if you're talking about money in a deferred account, retirement account. So rather than try to rehash this entire book, I think that if you guys read this, he's written this for financial advisors, by the way. This is, I think, the best book ever written for financial advisors. It absolutely reoriented the way I think about risk and reward and investing and stocks and bonds. And if you read this, you are going to close it and say, I get it now. Okay. So please do that. Here's a second book. This is not about being a financial advisor. Uh, this is not about investing. It's about being a person in the world. And it's a philosophy of life and of business that, again, I discovered this book around 2010, I think, also completely changed my life. So I highly recommend The Go Giver by Bob Berg and uh, John David Mann. Go Giver is about, it, it's, a, it's a series of parables, but what it teaches you is 
how to truly succeed in business and in the world? Like, what, is, what are the attributes of a person that makes them a success eventually? And it's very counterintuitive to what you might think before you come into the business world. I think there's a stereotype about Wall Street and business and entrepreneurship about like grinding and just taking what, whatever you can get and all about you and the advantages that you can build. And when you read this book, you realize, no, it's the opposite. Making yourself helpful to others. Caring more about what you're doing for other people as opposed to yourself. That is the key to getting ahead. Being useful and then be, being essential. It comes a point where you're so useful to other people that you're actually essential. They can't live without you. And that's when value, your own personal career value starts to build. And just this idea of, of being selfless, putting a great energy out into the world, giving to as many people as you can, and just becoming helpful and useful, the word spreads, right? People like being around you. They gravitate to you. Other successful people, they want to be in your orbit because of what you're putting out there. That's what I learned from the go-giver. And that's why you're looking and hearing, looking at me today and hearing from me today. And I've been doing this for a long time. And I've been talking to groups of students live and this year on, on the computer um, for a long time. And I love every minute of it. And a lot of that comes from what I've learned from the go-giver. So um, if you ask me like what to read specifically, start with these two. And I promise you, you're going to be ahead of virtually everyone else who's getting started and doesn't start with a philosophy. Okay, thank you so much for your advice. Awesome, let's go to Anthony next. Hey guys, um, my name is Anthony Janak. Um, I'm part of Wealth Management Group at UW-Madison. Um, my question for Josh is, um, you touched on how obviously you started a career um, you know, as a, a stockbroker and stuff, and you didn't get into wealth management till the 2008 recession. And you touched on a bit about like what you need to be a financial planner. And I was just wondering like what advice you have for us uh, graduating into a recession, like trying to find a job, um, what, any advice you have about that? So it's not as hard to find a job in wealth management as you might think right now, because as I mentioned earlier, we're in expansion mode. Our, our part of the industry is in expansion mode. What's different is that it's not the large firms that are doing most of the hiring and training anymore. So 20 years ago, the way to break into this profession was to get a job at Merrill Lynch. Uh, or get a job at Morgan Stanley, or there used to be a firm called Smith Barney. Um, there was a firm called Payne Weber. I, I know like I'm dating myself, but these were firms where they would hire thousands of young people out of college and have like a three-year training program. And not everybody made it, but that was by design. They only wanted like the best of the best to make it through the program. But then those people would get put onto a team. And then that team would look out for that young person and um, you know, gradually develop them into financial advisors. That system is kind of dead. It's kind of gone away. What firms like Merrill, Merrill doesn't even exist anymore. It's Bank of America. But what those firms have done with their training has had to change because of the times that we're in. And so a lot of them will put the young advisor into like a call center. And just like you pick up the 800 number. And you're going to talk to people that have less than a quarter million dollars with the firm, right? Um, people with a quarter million dollars and less don't get a dedicated advisor. So they get the call center. So I'm not saying that's terrible. I'm just saying it's not optimal. So if I'm, a, if I'm somebody that wants to be in wealth management, my main focus is who are the registered investment advisory firms in my region who are the most successful firms and how do I get myself on their radar? So that's, that is how I would approach knowing everything I know right now. That is how I would approach 
uh, breaking into this industry. You've got to find mentorship. Now, there are a lot of people in our industry that are, um, I, I want to be very delicate here and not cause a controversy. There are a lot of people in our industry who are like more motivational speaker than they are actual practitioner. And many of them are selling this fantasy that you're going to be 22 years old and start attracting millionaires as clients by launching your own firm. It's highly unrealistic. The main reason is that most of the wealth is concentrated among people who are older. Obviously, it's always been that way. They've had longer careers and longer periods of time to save. They're not giving money to someone who looks like their son or their grandson. So then the other thing that happens is people say, well, I'm just going to work with people my own age. People your own age are fucking broke. You're broke. There's nothing to talk about. You're not going to manage wealth for somebody who's 24 years old. They don't have any. Now, you can help them pay their credit card bills on time. That's not a career. So I really feel strongly that I'm going to graduate college and start a firm. Just because you can do something doesn't mean you should. Are the tools available? Yes. Can you join a network of other young financial planners and have camaraderie? Yes. I don't think it's optimal for most people. Some people will be able to make that work through sheer force of will and determination, but are they really learning anything? They don't have any mentorship. Mentorship is important, right? Even at my level, I have people that I look up to and call and ask questions, right? Um, so I really feel like if you want to do this the right way, find successful firms that are, you know, within reason located somewhere that geographically you can get a meeting. Don't do this. Hey, I want to pick your brain stuff. Nobody wants that. But just like I, I, I live 20 minutes, you know, 20 minutes away from your, your office. I just I'm, I'm really uh, passionate about becoming a wealth manager. I just want to run by you some of the things that I'm studying and working on and get your guidance. Like people will respond to that. Our industry, remember, our industry is biased toward helpful people. That's who works in wealth management. So when you ask them for help, especially if they've read The Go-Giver, they will help you. They will answer your questions. So if you can get on the radar of local firms, uh, that's great. The other way to go, there are only a very small hand. It's, it's early, believe it or not, in the RIA space, registered investment. Advice. There are 18,000 RIAs, and almost all of them are solo practitioner, somebody with less than 50 million under management. That's most of the firms. There are only a handful of firms uh, that have over $5 billion under management. Like, like seriously, there's like 20, okay? So our industry is very much, uh, some people call it like barber shops. Like there's a barber shop in every town. All right, that's good and it's bad. But be that as it may, there are some national firms, and we're one of them, that have a footprint all over the country and have employees, not just regionally, but all over the country. Those firms have opportunities too. So it's two different ways to go, uh, but I would just highly recommend uh, going that route. The last thing I'll just mention, not everybody wants that much independence. There are a lot of people that just, they wanna build their career slowly, but they wanna start out in a very corporate controlled environment, and they wanna have some safety and security uh, that they're learning the right things and that they're building the resume. And I wish that I had gone that route personally. I never had that security, right? I had a lot of stress in my life. Um, but for those people that are looking for that, Vanguard, Fidelity, Schwab, these are phenomenal organizations, like top shelf, high class organizations. When you go to work for them, they truly take care of you. They care about you. You're not going to make millions of dollars being there. But if that's how you spend your first five or 10 years in this business, you will come out of there, um, ass you know, assuming someday you leave and go independent, you will come out of there with a lot of training and a lot of confidence that you know what you're doing. So there are many different ways to break into this industry. 
And a lot of the right way will depend on what, what, what your personality is and what you're personally looking for. It's a great question. Thanks, Anthony. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, it's so great that you mentioned that, Josh, because actually Fidelity and Vanguard will be here later um, to do the employer portion of the- We work with, we work with both. We use uh, Vanguard products in our asset allocation models, Vanguard ETFs. Yeah. And Fidelity is one of our uh, custodian firms where we hold client assets. Yeah. And uh, both of them have great reputations in terms of how they train young advisors um, and, and teach them how to talk to clients and how to help people. So, All right, let's go to Oscar next. Yeah, so um, Oscar Griner from Michigan State University. Um, and this is a little bit off topic, can, but can you walk us through some of the highlights of your office back here? You got a lot of interesting items, <laughs> maybe, you know, there was two or three things that like really stick out. I'm seeing Biggie back there, you know, no baby. You know, so like, give us a highlight. Okay. So this is my pandemic uh, shelter. My real office is on Bryant Park in Manhattan. I'm actually on Long Island, five minutes from my house. And I'm stuck here until we can go back to uh, the city. Uh, so it's not so terrible though. I got baby Yoda in the house. Uh, let me see what else I could show you. I don't know if anyone knows who this guy is. This is Brian Chesky. He is the founder of Airbnb, which just became one of the largest IPOs ever. Um, came public like a month ago. Huge, huge uh, winner. Amazing story. The reason it's a box of cereal, a lot of people don't know this. Airbnb was founded during the financial crisis in 2008. Chesky was running the whole company on his credit card. True story. And was about to have to shut it down. And then they came up with this idea they could sell cereal on the internet. They had a box for Barack Obama and a box for John McCain, the two presidential candidates. And so they, they were selling like commemorative cereal boxes with McCain and Obama on it for $40 a box. And that actually saved the company. So to commemorate that, one of the brokerages, uh, public.com, made this uh, box of uh, IPOs to, to celebrate their uh, IPO. Uh, I don't know what else. I got uh, one of my favorite stocks, uh, Shake Shack. So I got there the book about the founding of, of Shake Shack. Huge winner. Go look at the ticker symbol on, on that one is S-H-A-K. Um, that old man up there in the corner is Jesse Livermore. He's the greatest and worst trader who ever lived, uh, made and lost $100 million fortunes multiple times, and he did that 100 years ago when $100 million was an inconceivable amount of money. It's a great reminder, his story, about making rules for yourself and then actually sticking to them because his downfall every time, um, he's, he had a set of rules, very well publicized, told people about them, and then at the worst possible moment, he abandoned his own rules and blew himself up. Um, so that's a, 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 great, a great story to just be aware of. Um, that's my book, Backstage Wall Street, the black and gold cover. It's my first book. It's where I kind of told all the dirty little secrets of brokerage and my beginnings on the street. I admit to a lot of stuff in there. Um, just all the foul things that I saw and learned and did. Um, over here are my other two books. I did Clash of the Financial Pundits about, uh, about television talking heads, which I am one. And then my newest book came out in November called How I Invest My Money, which is a compendium, co compilation, compendium of uh, 25 different financial advisors who talk about their own portfolios, which has never been done before. There's never been a book where financial advisors who are always telling other people how to invest actually say, all right, this is how I invest personally. So it's a really cool book. There's some great financial advisors in there, some of whom you guys might be aware of from social media. Um, so that came out in November. Uh, so far, so good. We're still selling copies. So thank God I had a, a project to work on during coronavirus. Um, behind me is uh, The Notorious. And the other guy is Jay Pierpont Morgan, who I consider to be the goat uh, on, on Wall Street. Um, maybe, maybe the greatest of all time in terms of money management and just being 
instrumental in building the investment markets. Um, so that's, that's who's behind me. And then I got Twizzlers. <laughs> hey, thanks for the walkthrough. Appreciate it. No doubt. <laughs> All right. So unfortunately, I think we need to wrap up. We got to get to the next session here. But Josh, I just want to extend a thank you on behalf of everybody here. Um, this is so awesome. And, and again, thanks for taking time out of your day. I know you got a lot going on. So um, reaching out to us and, and, and doing this for us was awesome. So, this was so much fun for me. Great questions. I want to wish everybody the best of luck in their studies and in their careers. And I know you guys are all going to kill it. And I'll be very proud of you. If you liked what you just heard, please like, comment, and share. This is Vincent Pacillo, producer of the MSU WMA podcast. MSU WMA, or Michigan State University Wealth Management Association, is a student organization part of the Eli Broad College of Business located in East Lansing, Michigan. Our mission is to inspire and educate the next generation of financial planners. Thank you for listening to today's episode. If you enjoyed it, please check out our channel on all platforms such as Spotify and Apple Podcast. And check out our social media at MSUWMA and MSUWMA.com.